to uh, take a listen to this podcast today. Uh, I have Emily Taylor from ti- from Teeny Big, not Tiny Big, Teeny Big on with me. And um, here's where I wanted to have Emily on. So a lot of my clients are oftentimes going through, um, gosh, big changes, um, you know, whether it was, was shifts and growth and staffing changes, regional rollouts uh, from 2021, 2022, um, to trying to maybe discover new programs or new areas of growth. And there's this weight of the decision that has to be made. Um, How does that fit in with strategic planning? How does that uh, fit into informing what your next steps are? And perhaps maybe most importantly, uh, do we internally have that objectivity that is so critical when you're trying to chart your, chart your path forward? So that's exactly what Emily does. She comes in, um, when organizations have a big decision to make and they need to listen to all parties, they need to listen to the community, stakeholders, whatever it is. Um, and she's really this translator. Uh, I can't wait for you to kind of hear her approach um, of those big decisions and really helps people um, have clarity and confidence um, so that they can move forward with, um, with confidence. So I'm excited for you to hear this interview with Emily Taylor. Emily, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Sherry. So glad that you're, uh, I have another Taylor with me today, even though we're no relation. I feel like I always have to tell people that. We are not long lost cousins. Um, okay, Emily, I've been excited to talk about your work today. And I, I, I because every time we speak, I feel like, oh my gosh, uh, one of my clients went through that exact same thing. Or oh, I was just talking to somebody the other day. And um, I just love getting to um, really hear your expertise and something I think maybe, which is why we've clicked, is I love how even when we first started talking, that you were telling me about your background and who you really are, this like half right brain, half left brain person, where it's like, um, you can can think technical, but also think creatively. And um, I feel like that is a little bit of my secret sauce too, coming from a, a more creative background and then pivoting into nonprofit. And uh, today I, I, it's probably a little bit more of the technical side, but on, on my end, fundraising, we have to be creative. So um, I totally resonated that. And I just, I, I'd love you to just tell me how you got into this, kind of set the groundwork for this journey that you've been taking here in the nonprofit space so that we can, uh, we can build up our conversation from there today. Yeah, and I, I love talking to you about this stuff, Sherry, because I know we have a similar background. And so I know you get kind of the for-profit, nonprofit, the left brain, right brain. Yes. Um, so I've really found that nonprofits come to me when they, they're they at an inflection point. So mm. it's like the big decision that is bigger than them. Um, and it's frustrating. It's something where, you know, you've made decisions in the past, it's been easy, and now for some reason it's different. Mm. Um, And really a lot of that difference is because it's a decision that affects a lot of different people. And so what I've been able to do is come in and help help nonprofits really remove some of the stones in the path of those relationships, Mm. really see how the individuals and their community fit into the big picture of the decision. So um, part of that is listening to people and people are messy. It's really, it can be really complicated and frustrating to talk to people, hear their opinions and really use that to make a decision. So mm-hmm. what I'm doing is really using that, that more, you know, I guess it would be, now I'm forgetting which side of the brain is which, but the, <laughs> the right too. side I where, you know, you're really trying to understand, you know, people and their feelings and their humanity, um, but also be able to analyze that information and use it strategically. And so that's yeah. that's really what I've been able to do is is help nonprofits think strategically about the people that are important to them and use it to make decisions. Um, and it's really that left and right brain that, um, you know, the art and the science yeah. um, that really helps helps us understand, you know, the humanity behind the people that we work with um, yeah. and make sense of it. Yeah. You know, I feel like maybe our conversations have been so, uh, so rich because like, even in my own business, I would say 2021, 2022, you know, obviously post 2020, um, 
a lot of nonprofits had like, I mean, it's an understatement to say a lot of them had gone through significant changes or the rules were different or something that they were doing before is now like irrelevant. Um, staffs were like tripling in size. People were coming to me where, Hey, we were a $5 million organization pre COVID and now we're 15 and whew, <laughs> like just kind of sitting in that newness of, of what they, what they are now, or they were regional now we're national because now we're remote. Um, and there were some big decisions that people need to needed to be making. It was like, are we staying this big? Was that a one-time thing? Are we now a, a national organization versus regional? Um, are we like, you know, it's just, just this weight of everything people had just gone through. Um, I also feel like a lot of people like the, the, the knee jerk reaction is we must redo our strategic plan or that, you know, that, that type of conversation comes into it. Um, t tell me if that's what you're seeing. Like, what are some trends with, with this kind of in the post, can I say post COVID world? Um, with some of these big decisions people are having to make. Yeah, I, I think you hit it on the head, Sherry. Um, you know, I really noticed a big change in my business, especially um, in like 2021, 20, 2022, 20, because there were nonprofits outgrew GDP. Like they were really, um, you know, fulfilling the needs that were out there. And so there was a lot of government funding. There were equity issues that were coming into the spotlight. And these things, yeah. you know, nonprofits stepped up and addressed them. Um, but addressing them also came with a lot of, um, you know, pain that, you know, you had to deal mm -hmm. with hiring a bunch of staff. You had to deal with shifting your priorities. You had to deal with a changing environment where, you know, donors were thinking differently. You know, not other nonprofits that you might work with were changing. And, you know, it really, CEOs really stepped up and mm. and got there. But they hadn't had time to sit back and really see yeah. what had changed, what was different, who did they want to be now? And yeah. so um, I've really been seeing organizations that need a reset. Hmm. Well, and, and I feel like it's a reset. And, and uh, I hear actually just the other day, is like, we're exhausted. We're still exhausted from everything we just went through. Um, and, and why wouldn't they be? Like, I, I always tell um there's like, like there, there was never, I don't think, uh, a more important time. Like, like we never needed them more. Like we never depended on nonprofits more than I think in my lifetime, maybe as in that pandemic season. And so, um, of course they need a reset. Like with, they probably need a, a re everything, you know, um, can <laughs> yeah. you go a little deeper on, on like on the reset on the, like, what does that really mean? And what are you seeing, um, like, what are you seeing them wanting to reset to? Is it, is it like, which also I hear, um, oh, but please don't make me do another strategic plan. Cause like, we feel like we're just still trying to figure it out. Like talk to me a little bit more about that reset and, um, and what people are spending time on. Yeah. I mean, a reset, when you think about it, if you, if you really grew, if your staff changed, um, you know, just some things that I've seen in my own clients, um, staff doubled. Well, now you have yes. staff who've been there a long time, staff who are newer, and they have different ideas about who the organization is, how it works, the history, the relationships. So that's a big area that's frustrating, um, you know, really see it. having um, big inputs of funding can, yes. can really change your programs and you haven't necessarily, well, they might fit your mission. You haven't really thought about what you say no to or how you even say mm. yes to something. Um, and <clears throat> with growth, I think also comes, I see a lot of uh, organizations that relied on a single a CEO making a lot of decisions. And that can work when you're smaller. But as you grow, um, you become more reliant on other people um, to support your organization, to think through things, and they become reliant on you. You really need to figure out who is that organization beyond that CEO? And so yeah. a lot of this oh. has to do with identity and focus. And, and it's a lot. Um, it's, it's hard. It can feel like decision quicksand where you're in yeah. these layers of um, layers of decisions and you can't make them in the same way that you used to. Yeah. And, and that objectivity, um, I always tell people like, it's hard for me to say you're like, you know, investing in object objectivity when you hire me, but like, I, it's the same thing. It's like, 
I think sometimes, probably the same in both of our consultancies, we can see uh, we can see different solu solutions or a path to a solution just because we aren't in the weeds and we haven't been through what they've been through the last few years. Um, and we can say, oh, actually, it, we should just do that. And it's like, oh, wh why couldn't I see that? You know, it, it was right in front of me, but they can't because they're the leader and they're, they're, they're in it too deep. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of um, one of my clients that I worked with over the, um, I should say, right around this time, around um, 2022, they were, they were exactly this. They had a very dynamic CEO. Um, they doubled their staff. They grew immensely over. They took on all sorts of new projects over the pandemic. And one of their big issues was that that CEO had talked about retiring for 10 years and still <sighs> hadn't. So um, they're really dealing with, you know, a lot of big changes and and even more changes to come. And so I think they just really got um, caught up in the CEO making all these decisions. Um, and mm -hmm. what I was able to bring in was to help them understand where they currently fit in their community, what their funders saw their strengths as, what their staff found most frustrating, and just be able to, to make sense of it all, to sort of not take those squeaky wheels at face value, to be able to, yeah. to listen to a wider variety of people a little more deeply. And that objectivity really helps to take some of the, the tension out of things, some of the the games that that people play in the in the yeah. field and and just to be able to really simplify it and clarify it and what i love about this client that i was talking about they really saw um like people had a really more clear idea than they did about who they were and the change really? they were making in their city they really saw them as as the leader in their particular field and so mm -hmm. it um to be able to pull stories and quotes that supported that really helps their team align on who they were um, because they were just getting too fuzzy about all of that. I love it. I love it. Have they uh, pivoted into a new leader or like, are you, what, what's, what's yeah, kind of the we're results actually, for them? So um, that was, was so great. So we did this work. We we're able to really focus and, and help them see that they, the leader wasn't the organization. Um, and so yeah. by working with them and really defining who the organization was, they were they were able to be a lot more confident about um, hiring a search firm. So they actually just hired a search firm. They know how to talk about what they're looking for. And they're going to be in the process of hiring a new leader in the next couple of months. Oh, my gosh. That's huge. That's... <laughs> yeah. After, um, after 10 years, it's amazing. After 10 years, they did it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's kind of that taking a step back and, um, you know, and I, I have a, a colleague that describes it. She's like, we got to get out of the jar and then come around the front and look at the label, like from the outside of the jar versus like in the jar through the label. And it's really foggy and like, ah, it's sticky in here. Um, so you had said that they were um, like, they hadn't done a strategic plan for, for quite a while. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about that pause button when people are like, okay, we grew, this happened. Uh, it's been three to five years. It's uh, autopilot into strategic planning. Um, your kind of approach is like, well, hold on, hold on. Uh, maybe there's some reasons we should take a step back and is now the right time to strategic plan? Um, could you just kind of noodle on that a little bit and, and, and how you've kind yeah. of led people Actually, through that? As part of, as part of the, this work, I did some research and started talking to you know dozens of strategic planners about when they felt uh, nonprofits weren't ready to do a strategic plan. And it was really helpful because they, they do see it. They see, you know, not everyone is ready to do it. It's not even for everybody. Um, but some of the things yeah. that, you know, that we've talked about, um, you know, I talked about with some of these strategic planners is sometimes you, you can't solve five to 10 different problems in a strategic plan. If you, right. if you don't really know, if you're not in a good place to make decisions, it's going to be very hard to go through a strategic plan. Um, if you have decisions that are layered on top of each other, like these chicken and egg decisions, you know, for instance, if you want to hire a new, um, a new executive director, do you do the strategic plan first? Do you do some self-identity yeah. work? What do you do? And so it can feel like you can't do one before the other. Um, so when you don't have that sense of who the organization is, 
um, you really, it's like, it's like having a table that doesn't have a couple of legs. You know, you can't start mm-hmm. putting the stuff on the table. You really have to, to figure out where you're standing, um, the environment you're in, um, and who you are. And then you can start to think about where to go yeah. next. So I like to give people the freedom of, you don't necessarily have to do a strategic plan. It's not for everybody, yeah. um, but you could also do a bit of work beforehand to really gain that footing. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm anxious to talk about kind of that pre-strategic planning, but I also like, Emily, I feel like I hear a lot of, um, well, my board says I need a strategic plan. The funder said I need a strategic plan. I guess it's just time because we do it every three years. It's like this kind of, we should, or like mm-hmm. almost a guilty feeling that we don't have it, but like there is wisdom in in that pause and, you know, allowing that reset to happen, listening in your, you know, with, with your expertise. Um, when it's just, it's, it's kind of, I think what uh, it sits, it's a cousin issue with like all of these myths we're trying to bust in non nonprofit world. Uh, I look at it as one of those uh, kind of same issues. Yeah. I, maybe this is my, my left brain, right brain, but sometimes when I hear people say certain words like strategic plan, um, especially if they don't really like a board who maybe doesn't fully understand a strategic plan, I start to think about what do they really mean by that word? Mm-hmm. They mean they want to know that you're spending time thinking about your future, that you know where you're going, that you're not um, sort of flailing. Uh, and so that doesn't always have to be a strategic plan. Um, mm-hmm. And so I like to give organizations permission to be confident in what they feel like they need to move yeah. forward. Um, and if a strategic plan is only going to, you know, put a couple of legs on that table, uh, that might not be the right next yeah. step. Um, so really thinking through, um, you know, for instance, I'm at an organization that was really killing it over the pandemic. They, mm-hmm. um, they were able to, uh, you know, they were focused on a lot of equity issues mm-hmm. um, around the prison industry. And, um, people paid attention. It was, uh, it was big. They grew a ton, um, but they were, you know, they weren't quite ready for a strategic plan because they were still new. They were mm-hmm. led by the fa- founder of the organization and they hadn't really pulled apart some of those identity issues. And so yeah. to be able to see, um, you know, by listening, I was able to really help them see who they were, some of the the challenges that they were facing with their partners um, and, and really make sense of it for them. Um, and so it's just, they're able to now see who they are beyond the leader and, and make some of these bigger decisions. I love that. I, I feel like that would just help them naturally also think longer term and think, who are we now and who, who do we want to be, you know, whether it's three years, five years, 10 years, 50 years. Um, so Emily, I'm thinking of like a lot of scenarios. Um, like how can, like if there's a nonprofit listening, like how can they recognize the situation? Um, like if they're listening and like, oh my gosh, hold on. Maybe I shouldn't be starting my strategic plan in July 1 when our fiscal year starts. Like uh, when should I be taking a step back? Like what is that? What does that look like? Yeah. If I think about some of the patterns that I see, you know, one of them is that they've been sitting on a big decision for years. If there's a decision that keeps getting passed on, passed on, maybe you're making a big program change, maybe you're hiring an executive director, maybe you're buying a new building, um, those things that just keep getting passed, there's a reason for that. And you can yeah. really dig into that. Um, there's also um, some things I see like staff or board are talking about the organization in different ways. Um, yeah. You know, As I mentioned before, if you've hired a lot, if there's been a lot of turnover, uh, there might not be a cohesive um, vision of who you are. You might have a vision statement, but yep. people aren't repeating that when they talk about your organization. So really kind of aligning to I the heart of who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it's, so it's confusing. It, it, yeah. it confuses you know everyone outside your organization. So that's one area. Um, and then another area I find because it's so easy to get into a bubble of your expertise, your mission, your work, I find people just outside of the CEO. So a lot of um, the second in command, um, mm-hmm. people just outside the organization, they can sometimes see these problems compiling and bubbling to the surface even before the CEO. And 
just because, you know, that CEO, they're, they have been making all the decisions, things make sense to them. Um, and so I often find a lot of times the first person I talk to is that second in command uh, because they, they recognize something's off, um, yes. but they're not quite ready to make some of these big decisions. Um, and so they, they come to me. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like that's that, like sometimes that very visionary CEO and like the number two is like the tech and the details and the ops and the process. And it's like, I guess it's left, right, left, yeah. right, like in a, in a relationship. Yeah, it totally is. And, and usually people get, you know, I think that's part of one of the challenges is, you know, a really dynamic leader um, often hires maybe someone who's a little more analytical to help balance them out. And yeah. Um, yeah, that's really, you know, where I'm here to help is to see that vision, to see that analytical side and uh, help people work through yeah. both sides of that coin. Yeah, that's so good. So do you feel like um, in some of these scenarios you've talked about, um, I sometimes hear like, oh, that you know, funders are asking for strategic plans or, or, or maybe, I don't know, maybe what they're asking for is like, what is your three to five year vision? Maybe that's more of the question they're asking. But um, I mean, would you go so far as to say that some nonprofits don't need a strategic plan or um, like what, what's your stance on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm all for customizing what your organization needs. Um, so, for instance, um, the client I mentioned that hired a new, is, is in the process of hiring a new CEO, they live in a very dynamic field that changes mm -hmm. quite a bit. And so a strategic plan, at least at this point in time, just isn't the right place for them. They need to think about, you know, they mm -hmm. need to work on getting the new CEO in place. They need to work on, you know, building some some funding. Um, they don't have a development department. So like, you know, building that out. And so just some things that that allow them to then participate more fully in a strategic plan. So it might be down mm -hmm. the road for them, but it's not what they need right now. And, you know, maybe in three years they can assess what they need to be thinking about their future. Um, but you just don't want to spend the time and money and resources on a strategic plan if it's not going to get you the benefits yeah. that that it can offer. So that's really, I, I, I try to think about it economically. Um, yeah. You know, what is, where are you spending your time and money um, and what are you going to get out of it? So uh, you do have to think about the, the right place in the right time. Yeah. Because it's like, I think like, um, I think maybe just pausing and asking the question, well, you know, why do the strategic plan or what do you want from the strategic plan? Because sometimes I see people killing it with the one pager that's up and it's like, that's my compass uh, in the next group with the 40 page bound, whatever, um, or in, you know, in every, every shape and size in between. Um, and I always say like, maybe you ho hopefully you agree with this advice. I always say like, well, create actually the thing you're going to use because if you're not going to use it, uh, why, why would we be creating it? Um, you know, so that, that's my theory with a fundraising plan. That's my theory with, with strategic plans. I'd be curious to know if you agree with that. Yeah, I, I really see there's so much uniqueness in every organization. So as I help them go out and listen to their community and make sense of, of what we learn, I also, you know, I also listen to what they need. Um, mm -hmm. That's part of, I think, the process because some people are, very tactical. Some people are visual thinkers. Some people can handle the very big picture and translating that into their their day to day activities. And so we really try to find out what's that next step that's right for them, and what does that yeah. look like as a useful tool uh, to help them move forward. Yeah, so good. What I love the examples you're sharing. Are there other examples of like people who are like in this like? do we need one or, or don't we need one? Yeah. Well, I, I'm working, one of my clients I'm working with now, um, they're really trying to decide if they need to change their programming. You know, they were really killing it during the pandemic. Um, they focus a lot on technology and really stepped up to the plate. But now that people have leveled up their technology, they're just finding mm. the people they serve um, have changed and they have different needs. So, they're just not ready to go into a strategic plan because they don't really know 
what's next. So I'm in the yeah. process of helping them listen to the community to really understand you know, what needs are out there, what um, what's already being, you know, what needs are already being met, and how can we best match this organization with a really clear direction. Um, and they're going to need to go out and really play around with that before they go into a strategic plan. Um, but we're still going to be thinking about their future. How do they think about those next yeah. steps? How do they really be confident in what they're going to do next so they can talk about it confidently and make those decisions confidently? Yeah, that makes total sense. So can I, give me some nuts and bolts on what an organization can do if they're facing this, like some of these scenarios you've painted uh, the picture of today. Like what what are the steps? Sure. So when I work with clients, it's really we really nail down what's going on because yeah. Again, that like that sort of mix of challenges needs to take some analysis and pulling apart. So we really talk about what do they know, what do they don't know, um, and and really dig into, you know, what are their what's causing them pain and um, what what sort of questions they have around it. And that's that's when I help them go out and objectively listen to people and really understand what are the nuances around some of those questions. Who do we need to talk to to answer them? And it really helps, you know, really helps ground them. And we take that, take that information and just help give them, you know, help analyze it and help them paint that picture for how they could be more confident in getting buy-in from their community. How can they really make sure they're making that impact um, and have that, that community support while still focusing on what they do best and their mission. Yeah. I remember one time you saying like your ideal client is not somebody who's like, go at the interviews, spit out the data. It's like, I have a deep, deep desire to listen to my community, to make the changes, to hear the hard things, um, to have somebody be the translator of the data into something we really can, can use. Um, that's different than just, let me just go do focus groups and spit out data. It's really this like, skill that you have to, um, to really be that translator into something that they can need and use or that they need and use for long term to make big decisions, to, to inform where they're going as an organization. I just love that part of um, the depth of, of the work. And it really all comes back to listening. Yeah, I, you know, as much as I love analytics and data, I mean, I think it's so important. I think the second we lose sight of that, we're working with humans mm -hmm. um, on all sides of our organization, the donors, the partners, um, the, the people that you serve, like they're all people. And so yeah. I think as soon as we, um, you know, just do the same process over and over and like yeah. spit stuff out put it in a Word document, I think it loses some of that humanity. And so um, I just, I really believe in helping, helping organizations feel and represent people. And so when we can take, you know, take real pe people, take real stories and help make sense of them um, in terms of the strategy for an organization, I think it brings back that passion um, yeah. and the reason, the reason we're all here. We're all trying to help, right. help people help make a difference. I love it. I love it. Okay. Last thing. So I'm going to put the, um, I love your LinkedIn content. I want people to follow you on LinkedIn. I'm going to put that link in their website, uh, downloads, all, all the things. Um, talk to me about what this looks like to work with you of like, oh my gosh, we're supposed to be strategic planning, but hold on. You've said some really interesting things today. And I'm straight, like, what does that look like? Um, just how do you work with people? I guess. Sure. Uh, so I work with I work with organizations usually in a, a six to twelve month period, mm -hmm. and really I do this because I found when we do short term work together, when I listen, help them understand, and then leave, uh, nonprofits don't get that impact. They don't get the the real change that needs to yeah. happen to be a listening organization to see how they apply um, apply everything, the learnings to their decisions to their work to stay accountable. So usually my work is pretty heavy up front where we do that work. And then I stay and help organizations 
really think through these decisions. So they're not, they're not making them on their own and they're not going back to their old habits, that they're not losing yeah. sight of, of that humanity and all the people that we've listened to. Yeah. I can imagine it's a new muscle where it's like to get into that new rhythm and like, oh, we need to use that data in that part of our business. We need to use that here. Um, and that doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, it's hard. You know, everyone that works in a nonprofit is strained to the the limits of their capacity. And so I think being able to help support nonprofits um, and remind them, you know, what we talked about, what was important so they don't fall back on um, past past decision making yeah. habits um, and and really can move forward. That's that's why I'm here for them. Good. OK, so I said I'm going to put the links, but verbally tell me where people can find you, or where you want people to find you, just in case people are listening just to the audio version of this. Oh, sure. People can uh, follow me, um, Emily Taylor, at, at, on LinkedIn. I love uh, sharing those. I love talking to people there um, and really thinking through some of these big challenges. Um, and as well, my website, teenybig.com. Teeny big. I love it. Emily, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Sherry. It's great to talk to you. I appreciate it. Have a great one. 